to be Friday, March 19th meeting of the Secure the Village Financial Services Cybersecurity Roundtable. Thank you for joining us. Um, in a minute, we're going to be hearing um, all about credit card fraud um, from our guest today, Adam. And I'm not going to say your last name, Adam. I'll probably butcher it. How do you pronounce it? It's uh, Coffrin, just like it's spelled. OK, great, Coffrin. I will remember. You, you could have done it, John. <laughs> I should have, should have winged it, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, so I'm John Coleman. and. Um, my background is I've been in financial services for a very long time and um, in, in an IT, mainly in an IT and information security capacity, um, managing um, IT organizations um, in banking. And for anybody in banking, they know it's um, got its own unique um, requirements related to regulatory compliance. It's quite, quite a large framework of regulatory requirements. Um, for IT and particularly information security. So it keeps me gainfully employed. Most recently, a bank that I was working at um, for six and a half years um, was acquired in, at the end of 2018. So I've been doing some consulting and auditing work for a firm called Audit One that specializes in banks. Um, and our, our co-host for the meeting is Josh Peplo from American Business Bank. Josh, um, say hi. Hi everybody. Um, just a little bit about me and where I work. Um, different than John, work for American Business Bank, uh, a bank that focuses on on middle market companies. Uh, I oversee Treasury Management, which includes about seventeen hundred online banking clients. So everything from uh, online wires to ACH origination, um, kind of where we see a lot of, of bank fraud. Also oversee our credit card program, which has about uh, 300 clients and over 3,500 credit cards out there. Uh, so also deal with credit card fraud. All right, great. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and I'm go going to um, share my screen with, the, with some words of wisdom here. Okay. And... Um, but you're sharing... Go your uh, screen shows your slide and your next slide. So you're in, you got to move to a different, share a different screen. A different so screen. Slideshow. Okay. So you don't see my financial services, cybersecurity roundtable screen. We see your second slide and your third slide. Both. Second and third. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm, no problem. Now we see Microsoft's famous window through which yeah. hackers easily commit an out. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> All right. You told me about this before, Stan, about getting out of full screen mode because I lost the. Um... Yeah. That's okay. We're um, we're getting a couple more people here coming in late, so it's it's all works out. Okay. Universe is 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 uh, friendly that way. Here comes Absolutely. Somebody. <laughs> yeah. There's Mark Garcia and Michael Lipton, I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, where are you? Okay. How did you do it, Stan? Oh, well, you know, the easiest way is to take your PowerPoint, shrink it down so that all that you see is the slide itself. So you drag the, the thing on the left of the, of the major slide, you know, so that the little windows on the left go away. Mm. And then just show your, your slide. OK. <clears throat> nope. You're still in slide view. Get out of slide view mode. Uh, you know, slide. OK. Now oh, bring up your PowerPoint. Uh, never mind. I see it. I see it. OK. Sorry, all you got a bad driver here. <laughs> hey, but at least you haven't been drinking, so. Yeah, true. That's yeah. very true. Let's see if that works. Um, now, if I go, if yeah. I go like this, Let's just get rid of the X there. Perfect. Okay, great. Sorry. Okay, so as I was saying, um, 
let's move forward with our, and welcome to those who, who just joined. We were chatting a little bit before you got on. Um, all you missed really was uh, the introduction of myself and Josh Peplow, the meeting host, so we won't um, belabor that. We are talking about credit card fraud today. We have Adam Coffrin. Yes, I'm going to that correctly. Is our, well is our guest today and presenter. We also have, <coughs> excuse me, Melody Dodonis. Um, and Stan's going to introduce her. Um, she's going to be talking a little bit about um, BTI and, and what they do before we um, end the meeting. So um, anyway, welcome all. A um, little bit about um, what we're doing today. Our agenda is um, we're going to start with introductions of everybody, and that's um, a good a good place to start. Before I do, turn it over to Stan, um, who's going to. Um, introduce Melody and she's going to talk a little bit about BTI. So um, you heard from us. Stan, take it away as far as the introductions go. You can sure. start with yourself. Sure. Uh, happy to. I'm just putting my uh, name and, and all of you do this, please put your name and email address in the chat bar. Send that off to everybody. And also uh, put your um, the word Troika. Uh, if you want, one of the things we do that really I think sets secure the village apart is that it's not just, oh, let's go have a webinar and oh, bring on a great speaker and blah, blah, blah. Yes, we do that. But in addition to that, we're also about building community. It's ultimately the whole concept of it takes a village to secure the village is that if we start working together, as we start working together, start collaborating, start learning from each other, start teaching each other and start working together to reach the end users, as, as we say, whether it's from the boardroom to the living room, we got to get everybody engaged in cybersecurity because it's truly, it's, a, it's an everybody problem. When your home refrigerator can be part of a botnet, it's an everybody problem is, is, is basically the challenge. And when we've got Russia and China and Iran and everybody else that might not like America attacking us, uh, it's a national problem. So please, uh, put your, as I said, put your uh, name and email address in the chat box. And the Troikas, what we'll do is we'll organize uh, the people who put the word Troika, it's an opt-in thing, and those people will organize them into groups of three or four, depending on how many uh, we end up with. Um, and those four people in groups will go off and get together and over the course of the next month, spend an hour together uh, online in a Zoom call, or when we get back to physical space, if they're in the same area, go out and have lunch or breakfast or cocktails or whatever, get to know each other. And also in the context of that, uh, get to see how collaboratively you can do things, you might do things that move the, move the ball downfield, if, if you will, uh, in, in security. One of the pieces of that, and let's go around the, the virtual room, if you will, uh, so people can introduce themselves. Just a moment, so people who know will know who you are. Um, let me start down with you, Mark. Mark Garcia, who's one of our real close friends in Secure the Village, really helps us move forward. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mark Garcia. I have a, a consulting firm. I specialize in marketing and client development. And uh, uh, be, uh, previously, I focused on professional services like law firms, accounting firms, insurance companies, and so on, which have many, which have a cybersecurity and data protection uh, component or practice group. And so um, I've uh, joined uh, STV with a view to expanding that to actual cybersecurity technology providers uh, and consultants. And I'm working with Stan right now in a digital media room to lift the face of the organization with uh, both technology and business media to uh, elevate the brand. So good morning to everyone. Super glad you're here, glad you're supporting us the way you do, Mark. Uh, stay tuned for, we're gonna do some really super marketing outreach and then starting in the next couple of months, I think starting in May, uh, if, if not in April, we'll get that going. Uh, next is somebody, God, you're like a Secure the Village groupie, Michael, Michael Lipton. Uh, it's great to see you this morning here at like all of our events, I love it. Uh, yes, Michael Lipton with TPX Communications. Uh, we help businesses stay connected I mean, and protected 
mainly, you know, the main focus is protecting them like you would your home. You know, uh, a lot of people, it was interesting. You, you mentioned in the beginning, you know, you have your smart refrigerator that can have a botnet. And, uh, you know, I tell, I tell customers and prospects that, listen, you left your home and you locked your front door, but you left your back door unlocked. Where do you think the criminal? If you lock your front door and your back door and you leave your windows open, where do you think the criminal is going to go? <laughs> you, know? you don't put screens over your, over your vents and your, and your, and your, uh, your, your chimney and stuff. Where do you think the criminals are going to go? And so, you know, my job is to not only educate, but to uh, ensure and assist uh, businesses and individuals that work for those businesses to make sure that they're protected and secure as much as possible. And um, one of the ways I do that is through uh, Secure the Village of being a part of this organization. It's an awesome organization. I, I get so much more out of it than I can possibly give back. And uh, I can only thank you, Stan and John and everybody else who's bored here and, and continues to put on these events. And I will continue to attend. So thank you very much for having me. Well, super. We're, as I said, we're, we're, we're grateful for your participation, everybody else's as, 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 as well. Um, let's go to another, uh, Di Kriebel. Di is uh, my co-host on our monthly uh, technology and security management happy hour. And Di is one of the major recruiters uh, here in uh, California, Southern California area. So Di, introduce yourself, please. Good morning, everybody. And hopefully there's not too much background noise. We have some workers here at the house. Um, have worked with uh, Stan for about 20 years in the business, have been recruiting staffing teams from CIOs down to help desk, offices in uh, Westlake Village, California, but I staff primarily in Southern California, and as well as all over the United States, but primarily in Southern California. Lots of IT and security jobs, and looking forward to helping Stan really build secure the village because I've, like I said, I've watched him for 20 years. <laughs> and uh, in addition to uh, working with Stan over the 20 years, his company was acquired by one of my clients that I've worked with for about 15 years, which is Miller Kaplan. So it's kind of exciting. We're crossing paths many times over the past 20 years. So hopefully I can a lot of people that you guys know that are possibly looking for jobs. Super. Well, very glad you're here. Uh, one of the new people in our community is uh, another banker, uh, Megan John Jans Keen. Uh, Megan, say a few words about you and and, and the bank and all that, uh, so people can get to know you. And unmute also. Thank you, Stan. Sorry, I had to unmute myself across the phone and Zoom. And forgive me, I have to take a second. Hi, um, my name is Megan Johns Keen. I'm here from Citizens Business Bank's product management team. Um, we are about to kickstart a cybersecurity program for our customers. Uh, and our focus is really going to be um, educating our, our uh, primary contacts in educating their own employees in cybersecurity. So it's sort of this first and second hand education. And I'm really here to learn all I can about it. So I'm very excited to be here today. Super. We're very excited that, that you are here and grateful that you're, the bank is looking to reach out to your customers and help them as, as well. Uh, that's something that we've done with American Business Bank now for, good God is Josh, four or five years, I think. We've been having periodic seminars in very, various physical locations around the South Bay uh, with, with you and just uh, City National Bank does that, or did that at least, or still does. I would imagine on a regular basis as well. And we need more banks to make and do what, what you guys are doing. So thank you for, for that. Uh, another uh, old timer in, in security like me, Stephen Bernard. Uh, Stephen, you wanna introduce yourself as, as well? A couple of words about to you, you know, good morning. Good to see you. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess I came on board with you guys um, a few weeks ago and uh, I have to say, I, um, I wasn't aware of you before, but I certainly am now, and I really see the value in what you're doing. I'm excited about being a part of it. Um, 
my background, uh, I have my own business, uh, do a lot of consulting. I do a lot of speaking on cybersecurity around the world. Actually, I did a group in Slovenia this week, um, which was really interesting. Um, and uh, before that, I was uh, with Sony Pictures Entertainment, uh, including during the time when North Korea decided they wanted to destroy the company. Um, and so that's a story of survival. And before that, um, I was in high tech with 3Com and US Robotics. And then in uh, law enforcement, uh, military in Vietnam and a few other places. So anyway, um, enough from me. Thank you again, Stan. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Max, Stephen. Great to, great to see you. Um, move some uh, other people. Daniel Howard, uh, please introduce yourself as well. Good to see you this morning. And unmute. You there, Daniel? Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, Christine, Christine Martel. Good morning. Um, my name is Christine Martel. I work with the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Chico Valley in Southern California. Um, this, it, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with Jennifer Terrell. She's one of our board members. She actually thought that this might be a, a good meeting for me to sit up in on, so she forwarded it along to me. Super glad you're here. It was a little bit, uh, there's a lot of little feedback on that, Christine, but very glad you're here and and and, and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Tomas, uh, introduce yourself, please. You're you're becoming a regular as well at our meetings. Good to see you again. Uh, yes, good afternoon. My name is Tomas. I am not in the tech field, but I do enjoy these lectures. I enjoy learning and I know there's a lot of, you know, IT fraud, a lot of IT issues. So these kinds of lectures definitely are very interesting. You know, I definitely take them, keep them in mind. You know, I definitely you know, try to share as, as much as I can to learn from them so that others can learn from them as well. So thank you for putting these on today. I really enjoy them and try to attend as many as I can. Cool. Well, glad you're here. Um, just heard from Daniel on the chat, if you're in chat, that sorry, Daniel, your, your mic's not working this morning, but come to the next meeting and get your mic working. We'll get you introduced as well. Uh, before I introduce Melody from uh, from BTI Growth Advisors, I just want to remind again, make sure your name and emails in the chat log. Uh, do put the word Troika there if you can uh, join us and add the letter L if you can help organize the Troika. Somebody has got to take the initiative basically to put out a, a doodle, you know, let's go meet this, here's various options or at least organize those lunches or, or those, those meetings. So please do that. Uh, Next, Melody, you're about to be up. I just, I'm, I'm grateful to Ray Adler, a uh, longtime friend of, of mine. Uh, he's, he's the uh, founder and, and principal of, of BTI Growth Advisors, and uh, Melody works uh, closely with, with Ray. And we're like very, very pleased uh, to have BTI as our program sponsor. We are just beginning a whole program sponsorship uh, structure for for all of almost all of our meetings not not all of them um and uh, the financial services cybersecurity roundtable which is now in its i think we're in our eighth year of wow. doing this john and joshua uh goes back a, a long way and you know so uh bdi is our, our our program sponsor for this month uh so you'll hear from from melody uh didonis in just a couple of minutes uh several reasons why we're excited about the relationship with BTI Growth uh, Advisors, not just that, uh, oh, they're a sponsor, uh, you know, that kind of thing, but it, it's in part uh, BTI's, uh, just their, their track record of uh, improving the performance of over 200 community and regional banks over the last 20 years, uh, it raised, you know, and, and, and doing that, you know, Ray's vision is I mean, the same as ours, that not only does it take a village to secure the village, it takes a village in today's world to get anything really you, you know, super accomplished. You gotta get all the players, all the stakeholders in, in the room and BTI is good at, at, at that. Uh, so we're working closely with BTI. They're committed to help get the word out about us so that we'll get more people here at our meetings, not just this one, but the others as well. Uh, 
with database marketing to their database, posting information about us on their LinkedIn profile as we promote BTI with you know a few minutes here at the at our meetings and your logo on our news of the week now as and 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 so on, uh, just helping each other grow the village, so to speak. So uh, let me introduce you, Melody. And again, thank you so much for being a part of us and, and helping us grow uh, this way. So please tell us a bit about B yourself and, and BTI. Great. Well, good morning, Stan, and thank you for those kind words. Welcome and good morning to everyone participating in today's exciting Cybersecurity Roundtable. My name is Melody Dodonis and I'm the project manager for Ray. I've known Ray, oh goodness, since about 2008. We started working together. I actually hired him to come in and do some training at a bank I was working at. So we've had a long-standing relationship. And uh, of course, I'm standing in for Ray today. Um, he uh, is speaking at, at this very moment in another presentation, but he is planning to attend uh, the Cybersecurity Roundtable next month. But we are quite excited to be members of the Secure the Village and sponsor the Cybersecurity Roundtable today. We strongly believe in the mission of Secure the Village. We are stronger together in the fight against the wide gamut of cyber crimes that we're such so vulnerable to. So to tell you a little bit um, about um, what BTI does, uh, sorry, my brain just stopped there a minute. Here we go. Our <laughs> clients are open-minded, growth-oriented executives and entrepreneurs who are driven to grow positive impact on the businesses in their society, as well as reaching their revenue and their profits. Every business has six key components for achieving strategic planning success. Those six components are the vision, the people, data, issues, process, and traction. Most companies operate at 20% in these six key components and succeeding in spite of themselves. We use a proven framework and process with developed tools to help our clients reach 80% strong in these six key areas. When these critical business components are strengthened, a company experiences more clarity, accountability, and engagement. This boost not only cultivates and unifies a company's vision, allowing employees to row in the same direction. We'd like to offer any Secure the Village member or company participating in today's roundtable the opportunity to take our complimentary organizational assessment to determine how strong you are in those six key components. You can email me at melody at btigrowthadvisors.com. That's M-E-L-O-D-I-E at B-T-I-G-R-O-W-T-H A-D-V-I-S-O-R-S dot com. Or you can contact me at 785-826-6099. And I'll email you a link to the complimentary assessment. You'll find it to be quite revealing and well worth the investment of the 10 minutes of your time. I will be remaining in the roundtable session until approximately 9.30 when I need to excuse myself as I will be receiving my first COVID vaccination today and I am rather excited about that. Stan has my contact information should anyone have any questions or need additional information after this session. So thank you again for this opportunity, Stan. And now I'll turn that back over to you. Super, well, thank you, Melody. Uh, and everybody just note Melody's uh, email is in the chat box. Melody, if you want to put your uh, phone number there as well. Uh, uh, certainly in, will. Into a chat that way. And you can, if you don't know this, 
if you look at the chat log, there's in the very bottom, which is where you type your own chat, mm -hmm. uh, there's three dots on the far right. If you click those three dots, you can save the chat to your own desktop. And it's always a good idea to do that at the end of the meeting. We'll send the chat log out to people as well, people that have registered. So people will have a chance Great. to get that. <clears throat> uh, also, if you've not put your contact information in the chat log, please do. Uh, and again, add the word Troika so we can get the, the community bill. Uh, with that, John, do I turn it back to you or to Josh? Yeah, to well, you, you can turn it to me and I'll just turn it right over to Josh. He's, there you uh, go. Mr. Coleman, you you own the machine. Uh, you, you, absolutely. You're the, you absolutely. Got it. So, um, Josh is going to introduce our speaker today. He did the hard, the heavy lifting of arranging Adam as our speaker. So, Josh, take it away. Good morning again, everyone. Um, you know, since the pandemic, we've seen all sorts of fraud uh, increasing. Uh, we all know about phishing malware and BEC scheme, but um, I think one uh, type of fraud that kind of goes underreported is, is credit card fraud. Um, it's certainly on the rise, as Adam will be able to tell you. Uh, it's coming easier and easier for criminals to purchase goods with other people's information. And what people don't know is that the business is often left footing the bill for the chargeback due to all the compliance regulations. Um, so Adam's here to talk about that. Adam is an industry leader in safety and security training for businesses and organizations. A veteran of Southern California law enforcement, he utilized his expertise to found Standards Training Group and Safe Kids, Inc. Adam? Awesome. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here with everybody. And I'm going to get my screen up here in a second. John, I think I might need to steal the screen from you here. Yep. Let me get mine going. And share. All right. So, um, as... Everyone can see that if I see some thumbs up. We can see it. Cool. All right. Good. Um, so credit card fraud. So a little bit again about my background. My name's Adam. Uh, I came from Southern California law enforcement, spent almost 20 years here uh, in Orange County. And I had some pretty unique assignments that was able to bring kind of this experience and what I'm going to be talking about to real life. I've spoken around the world on a variety of safety issues. And occasionally you'll see this ugly mug on television. Uh, both here in Southern California, uh, in Las Vegas, and nationally as well. So um, as I mentioned, both of those companies, we deal both K-12 through education with Safe Kids, Inc., and pretty much everybody else, hospitality, organizations, business, uh, healthcare, uh, all, pretty much the rest of the, the private sector through Standards Training Group. And so what you're going to see today is really the symptoms and the way that crooks are going to not only get your information, but how they actually use it and how they take it to either defraud you and or your business. So a portion of this is gonna be, think about it as, hey, I'm a business owner, I'm receiving credit cards, especially at the point of sale, how, what should I be looking for, what should I be concerned about? But then also personally, hey, what happens when I fill out that, that phishing expedition to my email or you know I get hacked or you know, my information's been compromised somewhere? So we're gonna see what crooks actually really do with that and the tools that they use to, to, to get that information and to, to profit off of it. So what's the problem? Well, guess what? In the U.S., we love us some plastic, right? Uh, credit card use is the largest in the U.S. anywhere in the world, and we account for just under 40% of all credit card use worldwide. So what does that mean? Most of the fraud occurs right here, right? So very interesting fact. I was doing some last-minute research just to make sure my numbers were correct, and this fact blew my mind. This is from the FTC. Last year, from quarter one to quarter four of 2020, Fraud, and very specifically credit card fraud, was up over 3,000%. There's almost 4,000% rise in one year alone. What's the cost? And it's, sometimes it's hard to get that tangible cost, but we're right about $9.5 billion of loss, not only to businesses, but also to individuals. And, we're, and we'll talk about what the chargebacks look like and why, even though you're doing all the compliancy thing, you have your credit card processor, everything's, everything should be working just fine. All of a sudden, you're on the hook for the chargeback. We're going to talk about why some of that is as well. So why is this so easy? Why is credit card fraud so easy? Well, there is a lot of roads to it, right? So if you purchase something in store, right? Come up, here's my credit card. 
online. And that's a lot of that fraud in 2020 came from online transactions because everyone was, well, stuck at home, right? Um, over the phone, if you're taking credit card numbers over the phone or a fax authorization, that's a super easy way to be frauded, especially as an organization. You know, mobile payments, um, mobile devices, paying from your phone. If you use Square or if you use any of the other mobile processors where you're at, you know, let's say maybe a pop-up venue, you're at a conference or somewhere and you're taking payments. Uh, Third-party processing, and we see this a lot in hospitality and hotels where, you know, Priceline or Expedia or Hotels.com receive the uh, receive the booking, they receive, um, you know, the, the reservation, and then they pass it through. And then all of a sudden, this person shows up and now they're paying with a fraudulent card. And there's, there's some accountability issues that happen there, right? Lack of training. And that's just flat out, we don't know what we're looking for, right? We don't know what we're not looking at. So, you know, a lot of, of the, the staff members that may be taking credit cards at a point of sale, especially in large organizations, are probably in their teens, early 20s. You know, they are not well-trained. They're there at a minimum wage job and they're just told, I'm going to receive this. I'm going to get the money. I'm going to give the customer their stuff and they're on their way, right? 24-hour operations, especially, you know, late night, most of this fraud it sometimes occurs late at night when no one's there to watch or the least experienced person is on your property, uh, you know, receiving information or taking those credit cards. And usually in customer service, there's a little dirty word we don't like to say, which is no. And I couldn't tell you how many times a simple no would have saved so many, so much fraud, so many heartaches. Uh, but you know, customer service, we're going to tell the customer, yes, customer is always right. And then we're going to try to deal with it on the back end. Now, here's the other part of this, right? Why is it so easy? This is what crooks usually see that person who's receiving their credit card as young, novice, immature, unexperienced, essentially, they're just going to take it and they're going to process it. So it's an easy mark for the majority of crooks, especially if they're walking into a Best Buy, they're walking into a grocery store. It's it's fast, it's simple, and it's it's they're essentially taking advantage of this lack of knowledge and the lack of what we're going to be talking about today. The other side of that is why it's so easy is there's kind of really two facets to this. Number one, they're the smooth talking criminal, right? They're the con artist. They're the smooth talker. Most of what I'm going to show you today was accomplished, not because they were super sophisticated, not because they had, you know, huge supercomputers and, and we're cracking codes and all this other stuff. It was, they were sweet talkers. They knew they had the gift of gab and they're talking to people who don't know the difference. And they just simply, I, okay, fine here. I, I guess, oh, this credit card's not working. I'm going to swipe it 15, 16 times. And I'm going to manually input that number because that's all I know how to do. And so this is what they're exploiting. Now, here's the next problem. When it comes to catching these folks, it's not impossible, but it is extremely time consuming and very complicated. Credit card fraud, by and large, is a complex crime. It's usually a game of numbers and it's usually a shell game, right? Hours of investigative work to try to piece together what in the world happened here, trying to locate victims. Uh, you know, I might have a name and a credit card number, and that's it. Trying to call a credit card company, I sometimes I can't even get a confirmant or denial that that's even their credit card number or this person's actually a, con a consumer or, or a customer of theirs, right? We have minimum prosecution amounts. Oftentimes, uh, local district attorneys won't look at a crime under $50,000 loss, $100,000 loss, just because it's not worth their time because it's so complicated, right? It's hard to track these folks. And I would say the vast majority of the time you're dealing with multi-state and multinational jurisdictions, which is a complete nightmare to try to figure out who's where, serve what subpoenas, get what information, and what court are we going to bring them into? Because if they're operating, let's say, in Nevada, let's say they're in a, ho they're in a, a hotel room in Las Vegas on a stolen credit card, and then using online cybercrime to purchase things in Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Portland, New York, and Chicago, who has jurisdiction? on all these different crimes. Are we going to, are we going to put this, you know, essentially extradite this person state to state to state to state for all these different crimes. So it becomes dramatically difficult to really try to, to, to put these people in jail and, and to, you know, have justice essentially in what is can wreck people's lives and can wreck people's businesses. So let's talk about that gift of gap. How are we beating the system? I'm going to show you some of the different ways that they do this, but this is a, a surveillance video from a few years ago. And what you're going to see here in the picture in just a moment, there's, there's no sound to this, so we don't have to worry about sound. But what you're going to see here in just a moment is going to be a lady who walks up and she's attempting to check in to this hotel. Now, you'll look at the timestamp up at the top. It's 2.30 in the morning. Um, obviously, they're not a whole, real busy at 2.30 in the morning. They're cleaning the floors. 
And she's going to be a walk-in reservation. She's going to be someone who just walks up to the desk with no reservation and is going to try to check in with a real ID, but a completely bogus credit card. And you're going to see some of these tall tale behavioral signs that something's up, right? So here comes your night audit, who, by the way, is at a hotel, usually the most junior person on staff because they're up all night or working graveyards. So she's going to say, hey, this is my name. I, you know, I, 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 I tried to, to make a reservation online. Um, I think maybe it went through. Maybe it didn't. This is my name. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you, give you my credit card information. I'm going to give you my, my ID to go ahead and get checked in. And what you're going to start to see is a few tells. You're going to see her playing with her hair in a second. You're going to see her, after she gives the information over, you're going to see two very interesting behavioral cues that are going to pop up. If you'll notice that her cell phone is on and open, right? Now, most of us walk around with our cell phones as it is, right? So she's going to give the information, and what does she do? Kind of hard to figure out if the person who ID you just handed over is actually the same person standing in front of you. So you can't see their face, right? What's the other thing she automatically does? Gets on her phone. So this night auditor is looking at the credit card, looking at the ID, and he's, if you can watch his, his, <laughs> his mannerisms, he's a little apprehensive, right? He's kind of looking up at her. He's looking down at the screen. Now she keeps her back turned this entire time. This is like a seven to eight minute video. She's on the phone. She's talking on it. Why is she doing that? Well, two reasons. Number one, her getaway driver is parked outside, right outside of those doors. So in case something does go wrong, she's got a quick getaway. Number two, isn't it rude to interrupt somebody on the phone? Isn't it rude if you're talking to, to excuse me, pardon, excuse me, can I, can I talk to you for a minute? So she's using these, these, these different mechanisms of not only of social, you know, what is socially acceptable to either interrupt or not interrupt somebody, but she's also doing it in such a fashion that it makes it really hard for this poor gentleman who's trying to take this credit card information and get her booked to actually process her reservation. So these are some of the cues and signs that you'll see, especially if the credit card has been altered or manipulated, or if the ID is not correct, if you have a, a false ID to try to match that information on the credit card, and there's a couple of ways to do that. You'll see these types of tells often of people that are trying to subdue. They'll look away from a the camera, they'll turn away from you. They'll look down, they'll be on their phone talking during the entire transaction. They're going to try to find ways to distract you away from what's actually going on. So what is it that we need to look for? Well, every credit card has got a bunch of security features on it and they're in plain daylight. Everyone can see them. Everyone has some of their own, but oftentimes not everyone knows what they're looking for. So let's start to look and see what real credit cards look like. So this is a real authentic credit card. This is a Visa. And these next few slides, we're going to talk about Visa and MasterCard specifically because they have some very interesting security features. And feel free to take your wallet out and look at your own credit card. Uh, don't hold it up to the screen because I don't need to see your number. Don't put it in the chat box either unless you want me buying a bunch of stuff on Amazon for you. But um, you can look at your own cards and you can see some of these details as well. So on a Visa, the majority of them on the front, if you look at the very beginning of the number sequence, will be also either printed or embossed underneath. And so this particular card, it's it's actually engraved. So the number is embossed, and then the smaller number is engraved on the card. So you have a relief and a and something that is is you know engraved into that card. Those four numbered sequence should always match. So that's the first indicator, right? Number one, or do we have a good credit card, right? Is this a valid credit card? Is it we got a valid expiration date? And the majority of MasterCard and Visa is if you flip your card over on the back. The last four digits of that card are going to be in the signature line next to that three-digit identification number. And so these are, again, front and back indicators to make sure that everything is, is fine and dandy, everything's chumming along, we have a good credit card. Now, there might not be money on it, but we have a good credit card, right? Here's where you start to see some of the fraudulent indicators. So at the beginning of the sequence, right, you have 5178. Below is 5-1-something, oh, right? Conveniently, that number that has been scratched out the last two. That the, the second numbers were actually nine and four, obviously not matching the front. If you look at the last four digits of that card, right, which is 0084, hmm, that's interesting. That doesn't match 4369, which is what the last four should be on the back of that card. This particular card was, was a gift card. But if you noticed, the name portion is also completely scratched out. So not only is there not a name there, either embossed or printed. There's just nothing there at all. And so that's kind of the first indicator, hmm, something's up here, right? Numbers aren't matching. The card looks like it's been partly damaged. There's no name on this card. This, something's weird here. Something's not quite right. 
So let's take a little bit deeper look at some of these cards. So this also is a prepaid uh, Visa debit, which I'm going to talk about why that sometimes is a key in and of itself. But the, the beginning of those numbers, right, 4694, doesn't match 4420. That's a problem, right? Now, I highlight the rest of the card, the expiration date, and the name is if you look closely, it looks like the plastic is distorted, right? So a lot, a lot of times I get asked, well, okay, you know, this number's embossed in the card. How in the world did they change that? Well, with an embossing machine, which we'll see here in a minute, and a microwave, you can have whatever credit card number you want. And so what they'll do is they'll stick it, the, the credit card in for four or five seconds in the microwave to warm it up. They'll take out that warm plastic. They're going to push it out and make that card completely smooth. So all the ink on it, all the graphics on it, the holograms, everything's still there, but the plastic is smooth. They'll then put that into an embossing machine and re-emboss your credit card number, whichever one they have, onto that card. And that's where we see these hacks. That's where we see, we're going to talk about the mathematical equation of credit cards here in a second. But that's where they are put that information on. And they have a couple options. Some will do it. Well, they'll put the number, expiration date, but they'll leave your name on the card. And then they'll create a fake ID with all your information on it to pass the card through. Others will use their actual real ID. And in this case, uh, this was a, an arrest I made a several years ago, that um, this young lady had her real ID, but she put her name on all the credit cards. And so in, in speaking to her during her interview, you know, I, I, you know, she had a whole, in fact, I have a whole stack. You'll see here, I still have the majority of cards from that case. These are all her bogus credit cards that she had and bogus IDs and everything else right here. Now, that being said, I asked her, you know, I noticed you have your real ID for the majority of these cases. And she's like, yeah, because when someone took both the, the credit card and the ID, they would scrutinize the ID far more than they would the credit card. So while they're looking at my ID and making sure that's real, that credit card went through and they didn't pay any attention to what it was. So oftentimes they will use their real ID, but they'll use their name on the on the fraudulent credit card or on the remade credit card. So this is what that looks like. And that's what the plastic looks like when it's been re-embossed. It's got kind of this warped, kind of white, kind of clear type color. Now you're gonna see here in a minute, some will use white out and they'll actually paint over it to try to get back to, to white. Some are a little more sophisticated. They'll either use gold leaf or silver leaf to try to push back over the top to make it seem like it's a correctly embossed card. Otherwise, you're going to see this distorted plastic and the card's going to feel a little warped from the entire thing being warmed up. Now, on the back of this card, there's also a couple of tails here. Um, last time I checked, the PIN number wasn't handwritten in by the person who pressed the card at the credit card company and sent it out, right? So she rewrote in ink the three-digit PIN here. She also put the, the zip code on the back in the signature line. Now, for any of you who purchase gas at a gas station and when you put your card in and ask you for your zip code, most of us know our own zip codes, right? Well, the crooks don't. So the crooks will take the zip codes that, that attach to that credit card and put it in the signature line so they know which zip code goes to which stolen card that they're trying to use. And the other thing you'll notice, again, this Visa prepaid. Now, again, some prepaid credit cards are issued. I know Walmart and a few others will issue you kind of from their bank with their name on it. But the majority of prepaid cards are coming from 7-Eleven or someplace where you pick the card up, you walk up, you give it over to the person, they're going to charge it uh, with funds or they're going to put your name on it and they're going to send you on your way. So I, anytime I see prepaid, I always take a real hard look to see, okay, is this name correct? Should, this, should, there, should there be a name here or should it say value customer or, or you know, whatever kind of you know, cliche thing that they're going to put to, <laughs> in that area to talk to their customers? Now let's talk about American Express. So Visa MasterCard is gonna account for the vast majority of all the cards in circulation. Discover has essentially the same type of security standards that they do. American Express, because they like to be different, has, is a bit of divergent from the normal credit cards, right? They have a four digit pin they like to put on the front, not the back. Uh, obviously their sequencing is broken up in a different fashion on the front. Um, and they also like to print their entire credit card number on the signature line on the back of the card. So your number on the front of the card is the same as on the back of your card, which makes it should be in theory, a little bit harder to fraud, right? So here's a fraudulent American Express card. And this is where I talked about that whiteout being used on top of the numbers. So she re-embossed the card with a bogus credit card number. You can tell because the credit card number on the front, lo and behold, does not match the one on the back because there is not one. 
you can see in that photo a little bit, the ghosting of the ink that was there, the original credit card number. You can kind of see it if you manipulate it in the light. I tried to do it as best as I could in the, in the photo here, that they removed that altogether. The embossed number, the four digit at top. By the way, American Express does not emboss their four digit numbers, they print them. And on this card, it was embossed. So again, another indicator of, of essentially kind of knowing the card, knowing what to look for. Uh, PIN numbers are virtually never embossed on the card. They're almost always printed regardless of the issuer. And so that's another indicator. And some credit cards, as, as we see in some of them that may have in our wallets, they none of the numbers are embossed at all. They're all printed on the card. And so again, it's having a bit of the knowledge of who's printing, who's embossing, to realize when something fraudulent is coming through. And again, this, this particular victim had her name embossed on there. And on the back, it was yet again, a prepaid card. So again, things to start to look at. So let's talk about prepaid gift cards and credit cards since they keep coming up. This is one of the easiest ways I've seen crooks take your information and really use it as a fraud, right? Because the majority of these are bought in store and they're charged. They used to, a while ago, just have these things hanging, right? So you just go up, I want this one, and this one looks like a cute card, I'm going to go take it. A lot of retailers have now put those behind the, the cage, so to speak. So they'll have the, the, you know, the box or the, you know, the, the tag essentially of what you want. And then they're going to actually go get the card and do it. Because what was happening is that these folks were stealing these cards. And they were stealing the cards because they were able to get good cards on the back. So if you see the back of these, all your mag scripts, you're able to get good mag, mag scripts in order to re-encode. We're talking about re-encoding in a second. And then take them to go use them. Because if they didn't have something that was printed, if they didn't have the good mag strips in order to use it, have to get blanks. And so what you see, these are blanks and on the back of the blanks are mag strips. And so you can print whatever you want, but this is another layer. You have to have a printer that can print on these cards in order to change the imagery. So it's far easier for them to take a gift card and then turn around and, and either warm it up, scrape it off, whatever the case was to get the correct credit card number on there. Now there's a couple of ways that that this type of fraud occurs. And so if your organization or you issue gift cards, so let's say you issue a gift card on behalf of your business or receive gift cards, um, there's a couple of issues here. And this is the two ways that the frauds occur. The top way is that that gift card is purchased with another fraudulent credit card or gift card. So, and this was happening, uh, this was happening to Target, it was happening to Hyatt, it was happening to a lot of major national retailers that these groups of fraudsters would go into a Target, they grow, go into Hyatt, and they would purchase $500, $1,000, $1,500 worth of gift cards using fraudulent credit cards. So at the time they would go through, there wouldn't be a chargeback, there'd be no indicator that they're fraudulent. And so they would issue all these gift cards. Well, the crooks figured out that when the gift card is issued, there's not a great tracking mechanism to turn that off. So in 30 days time, when all these chargebacks started coming for all these gift cards, that target was out the money, but the crook had good solid money in hand. So how do you liquidate that? Well, you, they come back in a target, they would purchase a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars worth of stuff. And then they would take that and turn around and sell it on eBay or on the street or wherever. So they're essentially money laundering from the, the fraudulent initial credit card to a gift card to actual hard property to then turn around and sell it in cash. And so that was one of the ways they're doing the same thing with Hyatt's and Marriott's. They were exchanging them for stays in which they were then again, creating more fraud while they were there in your stay. And so it's this tumbling effect. The second way to do it is what some of these pictures are gonna be is taking that, that fraudulent card and either embossing it. And so what you see, there's a picture of a credit card embosser um, or they're re-encoding it with an encoder. And they're about this big, this is an encoder here. Uh, not that hard, plug it into your computer. And we're gonna talk about what this does to the back of a credit card. So you get what we call a bad gift card. And so that way, this gift card essentially is shouldn't have never been issued. It was never issued correctly. However, the crook is is tricking you into thinking that it's a good gift card. So this is what a normal gift card looks like. So on the left, it's a vanilla card. Everything looks good. It's a gift for you, right? The first four numbers match. Everything looks great. On the right is the bogus one. And so what should be a printed number is embossed. Obviously, the number below has been changed, right? Four eight. Uh, something, right? When it should be 4833, and it's obviously not. And then you see the printed name right above gift card recipient. But if you also look very closely, there's another B above. They initially started to put the name and they had lined it wrong in the embosser. So you see that first B is too high. So then they lowered the card and they redid it again. 
Uh, so again, this is a, a indicator. And a lot of times they'll take these gift cards and pass them off as real credit cards. So the same here. So we have this, this holiday card, right? The one on the left is how it's supposed to look. The one on the right is how it's not supposed to look. Get embossed. They used white out over the top of those numbers. Again, the first four does not match the first, the, the, the four number digit below it. So again, we have issues that are coming up time and again with prepaid cards, debit cards. Let's see another example. Again, should say value customer, full name, embossed when it should be printed, but which by the way, the majority of gift cards are printed by and large. There's a few that aren't, but for the most part, any sort of prepaid, any sort of gift card will have the numbers <coughs> printed on them as opposed <coughs> to them being embossed. So let's talk about those tools of the trade. How do they figure all of this out? Well, like I said, the more sophisticated ones are going to use this, right? So this is your credit card embosser. You can get this on eBay for about 120 bucks plus or minus. The legitimate reason for one of these is for ID cards, right? So the idea is you have an ID card that uses a mag strip for access control. You as an organization can put that information in. You can read information. That's the legitimate use for one of these. However, what a crook's going to do is they're going to swipe it. They're going to use the software that comes with this or you can download it on the dark web. And they're going to be able to put their name with your credit card information, with whatever information they want on the back of that card. So when you swipe it, it comes up, looks like perfectly normal. In fact, some crooks, if you use one of these, will actually not touch the card at all. They won't use, they won't re-emboss it. They won't do a darn thing. They'll just put your information on it using one of these. And then that way, when it swipes, and many of you are saying, yeah, but I have, we have EVM chips and everything else. I'll get to that in a minute. But if you're still using swipes, you swipe it and all the credit card information comes up, looks completely normal, though none of it matches the card whatsoever. And like I said, we talk about those blanks, right? So using blanks or using cards, if you ever see a ton of cards floating around, there are blanks with this and on the back, that's problematic as well. Um, and the embossers. So the embossers run about 250 bucks. I have one. Um, it was a little big to hold up in front of the screen, but when we do this type of session in person, we actually emboss cards so you can see what it looks like. But it's like, it's literally like a, um, a casino slot machine. You see that handle? You just pull that thing and run that large dial at the top to whatever number or letter that you want and put the card in the middle. State of California, that's a felony to possess if you don't have a lawful reason for it. So everything else is not. The encoder, you can possess. Blank cards, not illegal. The embosser, though, that's the one place where we can get crooks is, is if they have an embossing machine. And those are usually found inside of CD motels that were used with, guess what, fraudulent credit cards. So that's how they get some of the information onto the cards. Now, some of the other tools of the trade are some of these, right? A laptop. Got to have a laptop to do half of this stuff. Credit card summary. So when we talk about the, your, your credit reports, credit information, they need the number and a name to put on it, right? And so that can be uh, handled a couple of different ways. So obviously, all the different breaches that we've seen, the, uh, the Equifax breach was one of those. Um, some, by the way, if, you, if you're a business and you're, you, you're withholding or, or maintaining credit card information, that should be extremely secured. Um, a few years ago, we actually made an arrest um, out of a resort district and we located big, it was, it was like the traditional burger, right? They had these pillowcases full of stuff and we arrested them. The pillowcases were full of the hotel's credit card transactions and folios for the last four or five years. They kept them in the storeroom with one little padlock. And this crook had broken in there and had taken all this and they were using that information to create credit cards. The other way that we can get credit card information outside of phishing, outside of just hard theft, is using one of these. Hold this up so you can see just how big that is. This fits in your pocket. This is a credit card, re, uh, essentially a recorder, right? So it's about palm size like this. And so if you have a retailer where you especially, and we see this a lot in restaurants, we see it a lot in places where transactions don't necessarily happen in front of you. If you think you go to a restaurant, I know it's been a year since most of us have been to one, but when <laughs> we thought about when we were going to one, you put your credit card down and that server walks away, right? Presumably they swipe your card, they get the receipt and they bring it back. Well, what was happening is that if I'm a crook, and I know this person's making $12 an hour, $15 an hour with some tips, and they're 18, 19, 20 years old, they're trying to pay for college, whatever the case may be, I'm going to give you $500 for one night. I'm going to give you 500 bucks. You're going to take this little, little, this little trinket here. And every single time you get a credit card, I want you to swipe it through this. That's all I want you to do. Keep it in your apron, keep it out of sight. And then at the end of the night, you're going to give this back to me. The more sophisticated ones actually hook up to a Wi-Fi network or their, or their own little mini hotspot for real-time transactions. 
But for four or 500 bucks, I can collect good, solid, real-time credit card information from folks. I can then use that night before they're in, you know, none the wiser, essentially. And it's cheap for me to pay four or 500 bucks to a kid to do this, to get real information than blasting out hundreds of phishing emails and, 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 or trying to steal mail from someone, which again, happens quite a bit. But these are just some of the ways that they're getting that information from you out of your pockets and onto cards of their own. So what is on a credit card? And I'm not sure if we have the sound here. Let me just, I'm going to stop share real quick just to make sure that we have the sound turned on. Share my sound. But credit cards have more information on them than you may believe. And so this short video is going to talk about all that information and the binary components of that credit card number of how we can figure out as a crook your number sometimes without ever even seeing your card. Those numbers in the front of your credit card, they aren't just random. They give away specific information about your card and where it comes from. The first digit of your credit card number is the industry identifier. This tells you the industry of the credit card issuer. For example, airline industry cards begin with a one or a two. Travel or entertainment cards, such as American Express or Diners Club cards, begin with a three. All Visa credit cards start with a four, MasterCard with a five, and six is dedicated to Discover. The first six digits on your card, including the industry identifier, represent the issuer identification number. This identifies the bank that issued the card. And then, of course, there's your personal account number. This is made up of the seventh digit on, everything except the last number on your card. The final digit on your credit card is known as the check digit, or check sum. This number is set by something called the Lund formula, patented by an IBM scientist in 1960. The formula uses the numerals in your card's account number to verify that it's valid. Various combinations of the card's digits must ultimately add up to a number divisible by 10. The formula is mostly used to protect against input errors. For example, let's say you enter in the wrong numbers on an online shopping site. The formula will compute the digits don't add up right, telling you you've entered an invalid card number. That last digit of your credit card makes sure the formula works like it's supposed to. And now you know there's a lot of information on that little card in your wallet. Kristen Wong, CreditCards.com. Those numbers in the front of your- So what does that mean? Well, this is what it means, which essentially is nothing more than a series of mathematical equations to make that Lund formula work. So crooks know these types of things, right? So that we know Visa has to start with a four. So if it starts with a six or a three, that should throw someone for a loop. Someone should realize something's wrong. But when you find these crooks, this is usually they have notepads and books, and these things are scribbled everywhere. So here's what they're doing. First off, you have to stay up all night. So usually most of, the, most of them are high on methamphetamine or cocaine, heroin, combination speedballing. They're doing something that is getting them up and are, they're staying up all night, right? So that's the first thing. Second thing, especially the use of methamphetamine for a lot creates a sense of hyper-focus. And so they can hyper-focus and sometimes they'll take um, focus medication as well as a, as a means of getting high. So Adderall, Redlin, some of these other things. But what they'll do is they'll sit up, they're gonna get a a little tablet, or they're going to get their phone, they're going to get a laptop, and they're going to bring up an app that is the Lund formula, so that we'll have it in. In the Android market, there's a few of the apps, or they might go to bestbuy.com or Amazon or any of the other ones where you put in your credit card. And so like the video showed in that credit card field, the Lund formula is built in. So that way it knows without ever checking, hey, this is a bogus credit card number. Or, yeah, this is good, right? How often do we put a credit card number in and you get the little green check mark? That doesn't mean that they've already talked to your provider, that they know that's a good card number and it's come back. All that means is that it matches the Lund formula. So they'll stay up and they'll just run numbers and run numbers until they get a green check mark. Once they get a green check mark, they know that pretty much the first uh, 12 numbers of that card are gonna be legitimate. Now all they gotta do is figure out the last four. And that's what you see in these cards. You see these runs and numbers. So I'm like on the right-hand side, you'll see the top five X, 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 X. And so all they did is they took that sequence from American Express and they are running four digit numbers until they got a green check mark, which is the, the row of you know, 4,004, 4,012, um, 4020, all those types of things. Same with below. So you'll see in that middle one, 2010, 59, seven, they're using the, the pretext before to figure out the last two or the last four of that sequence. And again, they don't know who you are. 
they don't have any idea where you are. All they know is that that's a valid credit card number for America Express, Visa, you know, whatever, and they're going to use it. So that's the first kind of hard way. And this number can be used, uh, especially online in areas that don't require multiple authentication. So in some of the providers that aren't asking for a zip code, they aren't asking for a three or four digit PIN number. All they're looking for is a name and they're looking for a credit card. And by the way, some of those, which by the way, aren't always compliant, are not even bothering to check that the zip code and the name matches the credit card number. As long as it's matching the LUN formula, they're taking the risk and accepting the card. Now, here are some other kind of tricks of the trade. If you actually have to go in person, you got to be able to sign. So you'll see signature forms where they're practicing signatures, probably from something they got out of the mail, usually outgoing mail, right? If they're going to sideswipe your, your bills coming out and checks, then they're going to have a signature on a check and check fraud the whole another <laughs> whole another topic. But you'll see them practicing signatures, especially if they're going to sign bank documents. You'll see the rungs of credit card numbers. So here you'll see the, the four with the four digit or the three digit pin as well as the expiration dates. And so some of these are coming from phishing, some of it's coming from dark web, some of it is coming from the little devices like this that's capturing all that device at a point of sale. Any number of ways to do it. If you have any forced entry or force hack into a banking system, I know the target hack from a few years ago was actually internal. Uh, they were able to kind of essentially put a Trojan inside via USB drive at a point of sale that spread was able to capture all this information like a key logger. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that this can happen and this information can get out there. So let's talk about accepting cards. So now that we understand what's going on, how are they doing it, and what does it look like? How do we prevent it, especially if we're accepting, it, accepting them? Number one, uh, don't take the McLovin ID, right? So <laughs> make sure we're checking IDs and make sure that we're checking these credit cards, right? So I always say, look, when you accept it, you want to check for the card type, right? What is it? Is it a debit? Is it a normal credit card? Is it is it a gift card or a prepaid card? If it's gift or prepaid, doesn't matter how trusting or non-trusting the person looks, I would be suspicious right off the get-go. And I always check a prepaid um, or a gift card much harder than I would a normal card. I mean, I'm going to check all of them, but that should be the first raise of suspicion that something, something might be off, right? Check the condition. How does the card look? Does it does it look warped? Does it feel warped? Does it feel like it's been scraped, like it's been weathered or worn, or does it feel like a normal card in that would in your in your wallet? You know, think about how your credit cards feel and how they look compared to how you'd be accepting somebody else's. You know, if something's off, that might be wrong, right? Those distorted numbers, and also place it under a UV light, right? We always hear about cash going under UV lights, right? But credit cards also have a few indicators underneath the UV light, whether it's you know, like the fraud fighters here, whether it's just a little, um, you know, UV light that you have in your hand, because when you put it underneath, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see on MasterCards, the MC and Discover, they're kind of slick and they have their own logo on it, right? AMX is going to put it across the entire card. The V is always in front of the Visa. This is, again, a way, number one, confirming that you are dealing with a MasterCard, a Visa, whichever one you're dealing with, that it's not a blank printed card, essentially, to make sure that those aren't there. Again, it's just another layer a protection, or if you have a card that has been altered and you're not quite sure who the issuer, the, who the issuer is, put it underneath the light, and it's going to tell you pretty quickly who issued that card or what type of card that it should be. The other thing is, let me back up for a second. If the card's been altered, baked, or washed, most of these are going to be very faint, if not completely gone. Um, so that's another indicator that if these indicators aren't there, and it is in fact a Mastercard, that there could be some damage to the ink for the UV that would indicate fraud. So how do you check them? So here I am, I'm working, uh, you know, I'm at the front of my store and I get a credit card. What's the first thing I do? Well, and I always do it very simply when they hand over the credit card. Now, again, we're going to talk about two different ways, the old fashioned way where they're handing a card over, right? They're, we're not, you know, with handing a little thing out for them to stick the card into. So again, credit card fraud, another reason it's gone up is that we don't want people touching our stuff to swipe cards, so to speak. But if you are accepting them, See if you can't look at the card and the ID. You know, a card comes out, you go, oh, hey, can I see your ID real quick too? Awesome, thank you. And then you make small talk for about the three seconds it's going to take. Oh, hey, did you find everything okay? Did you enjoy your shopping experience? Because what I'm doing is I'm looking at the front of that card. I'm looking to make sure the first four match the four underneath. I'm making sure that the card looks right, feels right, right? Looking sure that we have a good expiration date, that we actually have a card holder name, should it supposed to be there. I'm also comparing that to the ID to make sure that the ID name matches this. That's another thing I'm doing. When I flip that thing over on the back, I'm checking on a like an America Express to make sure that the entire card is numbers on the back and it also matches the front. 
I'm also looking if there's a four digit code on the back that matches the last four on the front. Is there a signature or is there a zip code written in that line? So, and again, very quickly, I can look at the front, look at the back as I'm asking about their experience, make sure everything looks good, and then hand it back, swipe it, stick it in the, the EMV slot, whatever the case may be. And that's one of the easiest, quickest ways to prevent almost everything here. Because what happened in, it happens in the majority of these, these frauds is you're gonna swipe this thing, you're gonna put it in the, in the chip slot, and it's not gonna work, right? It is not gonna work. And they're gonna say, oh, you know, you know I've been traveling and, and you know, ugh, the card's getting worn out and you know, I had this problem last time and this is so embarrassing. And here comes that slick kind of used car salesman fraud thing, right? Oh, well, oh, I understand. And they're gonna get you to input that number manually. So whatever that number is, the trick around all of these security measures is get you to manually input that number. That's the trick to get around all the technology. And that's where the majority of retailers are going to fall outside of your compliance. You're going to fall outside of all the things that the credit card is telling you to do to prevent the fraud. And when that chargeback comes, that's where you solely own the fraud. There is really no way around a manual punch in um, as far as it going back onto the credit card company. So we always recommend put that thing into a point of sale device, right? Stick in the chip, slide the card, the, the, the tap thing on top, right? Uh, the, the air transfer, all that stuff, have it go through the machine. Because if it goes to the machine and you're doing everything you're supposed to, majority of the time, majority of credit card holders will go, okay, fine, right? That was, there's a fraud in fact, not your fault as a retailer. Um, you know, we're gonna write this one off. We're gonna do whatever we're gonna open up our investigation. And it keeps the, the charge back necessarily solely falling on you. America Express is a little bit more aggressive when it comes to that. But if you're following all the policy procedures and there's stuff like video cameras over the point of sale, did you check ID? There's all these, the checklist, depending on who the, the card provider is, it's going to try to protect you as much as you can from having to pay for that charge back or you having the loss of business within there. So things that I say, here's my do not list, right? So my do not list is manually input card numbers, if at all humanly possible. Now you might have a longtime client, right? Someone you have a trusted vendor. That's, that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about that person that this is the first or second time you've done business with them. Um, you know, you're accepting a, a fax authorization. Uh, you know, we see all the time. Yeah, fax authorizations. Well, they'll 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 get it. They'll walk outside. They'll fill it out. They'll walk back in and hand it over. Right. That's not a fax authorization. Right. Those are meant for transactions across the country, and even still, extremely leery of any of the, anything that's handwritten on. If you go, oh well, yeah, I'm going to have them send me a picture of the card and a picture of their ID how easy are photos manipulated? So that's another component of this, realizing that what do you have that you can see, touch, feel, smell, taste, whatever the case is, right? Don't be manipulated by the criminal. There are some very convincing criminals out there. And that's usually the way the majority of these in-person frauds occurs. You're being manipulated by a crook to do something against policy procedure or regulation, right? And never, ever, ever place yourself in danger. The cards that you saw, the suspect in that attempted to kill me. She uh, attempted to run me over and then attempted to shoot me. So just because they're credit card fraud suspects doesn't mean that they're innocent, right? Doesn't mean that they're just, you know, and this, and she was about five foot one, probably a hundred pounds soaking wet, very unassuming. Uh, and once, once she was essentially caught and they called the police, I was the officer that arrived. And as I went to contact her, the fight was on and it went extremely downhill from there. So she got charged with uh, attempted homicide of a police officer on top of all the other fraud and forgery cases, right? So again, these people are dangerous and it can be extremely dangerous. Majority of fraudsters are also in the drugs, as I mentioned. They're also in the weapons. A uh, number of search warrants, we've recovered stolen firearms out of their rooms and, and weapons, all kinds of other things. So these people can be extremely dangerous. So again, don't ever put yourself in danger if you suspect the fraud or that person comes in, right? So at the end of the day, everything I'm telling you, right? If if something doesn't seem right, it probably isn't, right? You don't have to accept this, by the way, right? If someone could go, well, that's, that's, you have to. No, no, I don't have to, right? You also have the right to hold on to this. So if there is a legitimate challenge and you say, hey, you know what? We're gonna hold on to these real quick. We're, you know, I'm just gonna call the, uh, the local authorities just to make sure everything's on the up and up. If the person is on the up and up, they're gonna be annoyed, but they're gonna be, okay, I get it, right? Because if they have nothing to hide, it's gonna be a couple minutes, copper's gonna check this stuff out and everything's gonna be fine, right? If they are like, mm, yeah, yeah, let me go out to the car and they split, there's your indicator, right? They're not going to wait for the police. They're willing to give up a fraudulent credit card as opposed to waiting around to get caught. But remember what I said, it's usually their real ID. So the way we caught the majority of these folks is that 
the retailers would hold on to the bogus credit card and the ID. They would just split. We'd have a video surveillance of the transaction, their real ID along with a bogus credit card. And that's fantastic evidence for us to start to work through trying to find this person. Now, technology has come. And this was the precursor essentially to our Apple wallets and our Google Pays and everything else. It's called a walk it. And there's a few different versions of this. But essentially, you'd put credit card information into here, screen would come up and it would kick out this little fancy credit card here. And so it's a very blank, nothing kind of on a credit card. This is a mini re-encoder. And so you'd put your cards in here, choose which one you want. It would encode the credit card with the credit card information, come back, and then you'd put it back in. And this was originally designed to get rid of those big fat wallets that we all sit on, right? Um, this was very rapidly replaced, but there's still a few of these out there. And so obviously I bought one when it was out. And uh, I was able to fraud three of my cards instantly. And so I use some of these tactics on the cyber side and this thing doesn't check, right? So you could put in any credit card, any number you want, as long as it matches the, that loan formula, you're good. It's gonna kick out anything you want. So while a good idea, fraudsters use this for a short amount of time, there's still a few of these out there where they put in any credit card information they want and it automatically kicks out a really good card. So something to be aware of. But for the rest of the world, we have all this technology, right? if at all possible, accept this type of technology, right? So Apple Pay, Google Wallet, right? The, the, the transactions used in these are super secure, especially with Apple Pay, it essentially creates a one-time use credit card number for every transaction. So even if it is intercepted with an RFID scanner, which looks something like this, um, you're able to, that, that number is such a null and void after transactions complete. So even if it's getting caught in between times. This right now is one of the safest methods and it, it takes some of the human interaction out of it. Now, can you fraud this? Yes. And if you remember, there's a Starbucks uh, employee that was arrested a couple of years ago uh, for taking this type of information and trying to turn around and sell it. So there are some very complex, complicated ways to fraud these. That's not the average everyday crook and we don't see it very often. And usually if something is frauded by this, um, Google, Apple, whoever is the processor is taking responsibility for the majority of it because of the essentially the nature of it. There are still a few things that, that get by. If you can take a chip, absolutely. I have seen a couple of chip re-encoders. They're much, much harder to find, um, but they are floating around in the world. They are much harder to use, but a couple of those are out there. So if we can use technology to our advantage, absolutely do. So overall, to sum up everything, I've been seeing the chat box moving a little bit, so I'll get to that here in a second to answer some questions. But overall, if you're receiving credit cards, taking credit cards, if you're being asked for your credit card information, trust yourself. If something doesn't feel right, it probably is. And if something's kind of weird or hinky or suspicious, stop and slow down for a second. Take a look at what's going on, right? Trust the totality of everything that's happening, the card, the person, the conversation, the purchasing. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll see gift cards purchased and if we're using fraudulent money, they'll have a fraudulent hundred dollar bill and they're going to buy, you know, a $5, you know, stick of gum, um, because they're exchanging that fraudulent hundred dollar bill for good $95 of real U S currency at your loss. Right. And so the, the gift card game, the prepaid game was kind of that, that I described as kind of the same way we're exchanging bad money for good at your expense. So ask questions. Like I said, there's nothing wrong if, if that credit card after two or three swipes or they're trying to put it in, you know, at your point of selling, it's not working. And they go, oh, you know, golly day, you know, this thing's been happening. I've been traveling. Oh, where have you been traveling to? Where are you from? Oh, that's interesting, right? Start to get more information to piece apart their story to try to figure out, hey, is this really a problem? Do we need to help this person? Um, or are they, a, you know, a fraud? Are they looking to take advantage of us, right? If you can get a second opinion, if you're working with somebody, you have someone that has some more experience, you know, sometimes two heads and two sets of eyes are better than one. Um, have somebody else look at it briefly. Have somebody else look at what's going on and see if they recognize what's happening. Remember, if it looks weird, it probably is. So this is my contact information. I'll leave this up here for a second as I kind of go over to the chat box. But uh, as we're doing this, are there any questions? And if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, put in the chat box. But I know I we threw a lot of information at you in a very short amount of time. So uh, and it can be confusing when we're dealing with numbers and everything else. So I'm going to look at some of these questions here. Let's see. So it looks like from Diane, if our card does not have the four digits on the back along with three digit code, should we ask credit card for replacement? So some credit card companies, depending on who they are, should have all this information. If you have an older card, and my guess would be you, you might have an older issue card, there's nothing wrong with calling your credit card issuer and saying, hey, 
you know, I'm looking at the card and, and I'm noticing that uh, the majority of security features, such as four digits underneath the front, three digits on the back, four digits, I'm not seeing any of that. Do you have more current cards or do you have a current EVM card um, that I can use to try to protect myself? Sometimes you have to ask for that. I know B of A uh, at the beginning of kind of the chip wave and some of these other things, you had to ask for that. B of A also used to put your picture on top of their debit cards. So if that's an option, not too many folks are doing that anymore, but that's an option. Try to ask and add absolutely every security measure that you can, because uh, it's going to kind of help you know alleviate some of these problems. Uh, let's see here if there's any other questions. As I read them, feel free to chime in if you have any other questions, personally or otherwise. Yeah, being a victim is is it it's a it will steal half of your life if you're a victim of one of these trying to undo it with the credit card companies, undo it with the credit <laughs> with your credit um, score and some of the providers. Um, let's see here. I was able to prosecute the valet person who stole my card. Fantastic. Um, usually the first thing that they do is they run to an ATM or, an, or a gas machine and it's usually, or a gas station to get gas. That's usually the first charge any stolen card, um, or to a bunch of gift cards at the nearest target Walmart, wherever they happen to, to be. Um, let's see here. Uh, was unable to view the information. Yeah. So let's talk about the videos real quick. Uh, a lot of this stuff is going to be captured on video. And the majority of policies, and, and again, we're acting as a security consultant to a number of these organizations. I tell people don't ever, ever, ever show your video to the victim or anyone else. Show it to the police, right? Um, because it creates not only is there a privacy issue, but there's a weird connection here. So let's just say, you know, you you get your card stolen. You think it might be the valet guy, um, you know, because you're like, well, I had it in the car, now it's not in the car, or whatever. So you go back and let's say you look at the video and sure enough, let's say that video captures the valet, you know, stealing the card out of the center console or whatever the case may be, right? You decide to come back the next day and take justice in your own hands and rough this guy up, punch him up a little bit, maybe confront him with a weapon or something else like that to extract some street justice, right? Now, the person whose fault that ultimately is would be the, the person who showed you the video. So the organization, they showed you the video, you're able to ID that suspect. Now it's on the hotel, the the shopping center, the, the wherever, that they provide the information to you and they're liable for the injuries to that person, right? So if you wouldn't rough them up, they're they're civilly liable for that. So that's why you don't see video being released to the victims very often. Now, that being said, it, it can be, you make a report, gets released to police custody if they have video. And if the police show you the still is trying to ID the person, that's a completely different nexus of how this works. Uh, but by and large, you're not going to be able to see videos unless you, of course, you're the sweet talker and you sweet talk to manager and show in the video. Um, the other issue is a chain of command and, and a uh, chain of evidence issue. So if that video is evidentiary, you can't, it, since you don't own the video, you can't actually hand it over to the police. The owner of the video has to consent to the release, uh, either by subpoena search warrant or consent to the police. So there's some legal things that happen in there. Um, so, and it can be extremely frustrating because you know, you know, darn sure it's on that video. What you can do though, is ask that person, hey, I'm going to report to the police, please, please, please save that video because some of these video turnovers are in between three days, seven days, 30 days, or 90 days, just depends on their servers and their storage capacity. So if some of these smaller mom and pop places may only have two or three days worth of storage, have them, hey, I'm going to report to the police please save that video on a thumb drive and the police can come recover it from you and issue the subpoena or whatever the case is. So that, that is something that you can ask them to do. Uh, let's see here if there's any other questions. Do I recommend signing all your cards. That is a good question. Some say yes, some say no. Oh boy. Um, so back in the day, yes. So back in the day, part of the, the, the agreement to the card was you had to sign the back, right? Because you're signing this binding contract, a promise to pay, and there's all these other things that was in your cardholder agreement. That mostly has gone away. Now that's still sometimes in the fine print. Occasionally you will get someone who says, I can't accept this credit card unless you sign it. And then like I've had to sign because I don't sign my cards either. Sign it right there. Uh, some folks write check ID in that service line, right? So essentially you're trying to prompt them to be more secure, right? Check ID. Uh, some, if they're super stringent, will tell you that that's null and voided the card because it's not a signature nor is it your name and that's a signature line. Um, I will tell you this, I haven't been asked, and again, I don't sign my cards. I have not been asked for, for either number one, why my card's not signed or number two, to sign my card in probably the better part of eight years. <laughs> um, is there anything wrong with sending your card? Not necessarily. Um, 
you know, obviously it would, if your wallet ever gets stolen, it would give the crook more chance to practice your signature because if you have two or three credit cards in your wallet, your signature shows up two or three different times. Um, but also we're forgetting our signature is also on our California driver's license. So again, they're going to have your signature one way or the other, if they steal your wallet and your I and your, your IDs in there. Um, but the signature on the card, I recommend you, you can send it if you want. If you don't want to send it, that's fine. No one's really going to jam you up on it anymore. There's too many other layers of, of compliance and, and fiduciary agreement and, and online. I agree to this and that and everything else that the signature isn't necessarily required like it used to be in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, let's see. Credit cards still being used, used to gas, gas pumps. Absolutely. So these are actually called skimmers. Um, and so a skimmer, again, is very similar to what this device is. Um, you know, I call it credit card reader, but um, a skimmer essentially is a device that's put on top of another device to capture the information. So gas stations, ATM machines, um, parking areas. So if you go up to the little automated parking thing to pay for your parking, right? These are areas that a crook can put a skimmer in to that device to capture your credit card information as it goes in and then the actual point of sale captures it. So, you know, you might put your card in at a gas pump at a parking area, take it out. And if you're, you know, like I do, I have on my phone alerts. Every time my card is charged, I get a push alert, a text alert, and an email, right? A little annoying, I get it. But I know every time my card is being used somewhere, and it doesn't matter the card. If I get an alert on my email, on my text, or on my push, and I didn't do it, then I automatically know something's wrong. I can call the credit card company, shut the whole thing down, stop the fraud before it goes any further, get a new card issue, and go about my day. So again, a little bit of, of personal how I kind of protect myself in some of these. Um, but in those skimmers, they're already gonna have your information. That charge might not show up for a day, two days, three days, whatever. Uh, they have gotten very, very good at what they do. They used to put a entire block over the top of it. Now, essentially it's a credit card cage and they slide it. It's about the size of a credit card, just a little bit longer. They slide it in the machine. So you can push and pull and snap and do everything on the front. And everything looks like it's legitimate and you'll still find some old ones, but you put the card in, take the card out and oftentimes the the uh, the provider of that has no idea that's in there. So, you know, the banks, every time they crack over that ATM machine, they do a check to make sure that they don't have one of those in their machines. And most ATMs actually have a little bit of an alarm system built in to read a foreign device that has been put in the machine. But parking, gas stations, most of them don't. Um, and again, you know, the guy who's out there servicing gas station machines or is probably not making a ton of money. So if I offer them a thousand bucks to go put one of these little devices or a skimmer in there, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, so I always say buyer beware if at all possible, do not swipe your card in any place of public access, right? If at all possible, or like what a lot of folks do, they have to do that. Use a prepaid card, right? Use the game right back at them. Go get a prepaid card, load up 500 bucks on it, 400 bucks, whatever it is. And that's your burner, quote unquote, your burner card, right? So I use that. At gas, if I have to be outside, if you know, if I don't go inside the station, right? To you, if you go inside and use it, for the most part, you're going to be fine. It's the outside issues that are concerning. So I have to pay for parking, whatever the case is. Just get a burner card. So that way, if it's compromised, shut the card down. It's it's prepaid. It's got a couple. You know, at most, maybe you'll lose a couple hundred bucks uh, if they really get to it quickly before you under before you realize what's happened. But that's it. It's not tied to your bank account. I recommend never, ever, 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 ever use a debit card. It is directly tied to your cash and it's directly tied. So if, and if anyone who's been a victim of fraud has had their debit card taken or frauded, most know that it's usually a five to seven day freeze on your banking account. So if your mortgage is due, your rent is due, your car payments due, most banks won't move that money out. Right. And, and obviously we got probably preaching to the choir of bankers here, but you know, if, if at all possible, I always use the layer of a credit card company as the buffer, right? Because you can have a dispute with your credit card company. They can take it on the nose if they want. You can argue and fight with them all day long, but it's not affecting your actual cash and your funds at your bank. So I try to, I protect that like the nuclear football. <laughs> I, you know, my debit card stays locked in a little RFID shield inside my safe, in my house, right? And the only time it ever comes out is when I shred it because they give me a new one, right? And that's it. That's the only time I ever use it. Um, or if I have to actually go into the bank for a transaction, for some reason, I need that card. Otherwise, it stays at home. I never use it. I always use a credit card or some other buffer between the hard cash um, and, and the crook. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Yep. Skimming reports. Yeah. And so I will tell you, and I'll leave you with this. The most sophisticated skimming device I have ever located 
was planted by an ATM repairman inside the machine. It wasn't even a skimmer. They actually hooked up a, a Wi-Fi device powered by the ATM machine, and they hooked it up to the, to the outbound modem of that machine. So it, they essentially put two clasps over the top of the outbound uh, LAN wire that went out of that. And so every, everything that was being sent in and out of that ATM machine was being captured and sent out separately um, via a hotspot that was installed inside the machine. And this went on for probably a better part of a year before anyone caught on to it. So um, again, they can be extremely sophisticated like that or just very simple where they put something kind of like a dummy device in the front of it. So with that, I will throw it back to Stan for any other questions or comments, but thank you all so much. Again, my information's here. I'll put it also in the chat so that way you guys have it as well. Feel free to contact me uh, and ask any, if you have questions, follow up, any of that other stuff, more than happy to share and spend some time talking with you all uh, outside this presentation. Super, I guess, Josh, it's, you're up. Thank you, Adam. That was uh, really good information. I know uh, coming from a banker who uh, has a lot of clients that accept credit cards and we have a large credit card portfolio that was uh, rather scary information, but uh, good to have all that. Thank you very much. Ah, my pleasure. I have just one quick question. Um, Adam, there was quite a push. I'm going to say it was probably 10 years ago or so when it was clear that um, online purchases were going to become a, an enormous thing. Um, you know, the networks came out with, you know, because the card not present risk is really huge. <laughs> so they were doing like, you know, Visa did verified by Visa, which was kind of a, a disaster. Um, you know, if you opted in, you know, it interrupted your transaction flow and took you out to a different thing. You had to, you know, approve or whatever. Is there anything happening in card not present um, transactions online to try to detect some of these fraudulent card numbers? There is. So um, I'll take America Express as an example. So I personally use America Express almost exclusively. I mean, I have a master and a visa for those that don't take it, but I usually use America Express just because Number one, I know what a pain they are to deal with if you're a retailer. So it kind of protects me as the consumer, right? But number two, their fraud division is fantastic. And so uh, they very specifically have algorithms set up that monitor your spending. They monitor how you spend, where you spend, um, all kinds of very kind of high speed, low drag type things in the background to pick, try to pick up on that card not present. And they also have uh, that I use uh, is an email alert every time that there's a charge that is card not present. So it sends you a different type of alert and it's the second that thing hits them, right? The second it hits America Express as a pre-authorization, they're going to send you an email that says you have a card not present charge here. Um, and so that way, again, I have noticed very quickly, it's not the clunkiness that I have to approve it, right? Because essentially that means that your card is being declined <laughs> at these retailers until you get approved and it causes all kinds of problems. But most of them have algorithms set up to try to to try to to, to mitigate that. Uh, I know Citibank and a couple others. If it trips their algorithms, they will block it temporarily, or they'll suspend. It. Essentially, it'll be a pre-authorization suspension. Uh, so to the to the merchant, it looks like it's gone through, um, but you're going to get a text message and an email that says, "Hey, you have a a, a charge or, or or card not present charge here." Uh, you know, press one to continue or, you know, or two to authorize and three to say no or whatever. So some have kind of a bit of a lag on that. Um, but yeah, by and large, that's gone away. Most of them try to capture it in the algorithm of, of monitoring your spending and spending location. So as an example, you can't buy gas in North Carolina uh, in person and then also purchase, you know, um, you know, a Coke and a, and, a, and a stick of gum at 7-Eleven in Los Angeles in person, right? That's physically impossible. So a lot of them have those types of connections like, hey, this person can't be in person at the same time. The trick is, is if you're in person in LA and there is a card not present charge back East, that's where sometimes it gets a little tricky in trying to find the algorithm. But, you know, really uh, consumer beware, I guess I would say, watch your, you know, set up alerts, watch your spending, see what's going on. Um, and so that way you can try to take, you know, take action in your own hand uh, just in case it slips through the algorithms. And do you, do you notify your issuer or issuers if you're going to take a trip overseas so they know that you're going to be in a strange place? Well, American Express hates me because I travel, I, well, used to, let me take that back from <laughs> prior to 2020, I was all over the place. Uh, and so I, at some point, got an email from American Express that said, hey, we know you travel a lot. Don't worry about it, right? They were just pretty much fed up trying to figure out where I was going to be in the world. 
Um, some actually have an algorithm and they can, based upon your airline tickets, uh, will know that you're traveling someplace. So they'll pick up and you, sometimes you'll get an email. I know Chase was doing this for quite a while. It would say, hey, we see that, you know, we know you're going to be traveling to New York in the next couple of weeks. You know, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but many card issuers do have the ability if you log into your account and say, hey, and, and it's usually overseas is the big one. Traveling within the U.S., they tried to do that, like you said, kind of like the pre-authorization thing, and it just was clunky. It just didn't really work well. But international travel, absolutely. So when I would travel internationally, I'd usually let you know let my whatever card I was going to use overseas, I would only use one, right, to try to to limit <laughs> any sort of fraud. But I'd, I'd pick one, and I'd say, hey, I'm going to be in Europe, you know, or wherever I'm going to be from this time to this time. And so that way, it, I wouldn't get pinged with fraud that they knew it would be me. Um, and then again, what I'd say when I came back, so that way there should be no further authorizations from that country. So any charges in that country would automatically decline. And then you get notice that, hey, someone tried to use your card, but we declined it. And, you know, we're going to send you a new card or whatever. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, really, we are at the point where we're going to wrap things up. Um, we've certainly taken up the the whole period here. Um, we've got a couple of slides. If you want to um, turn over the control there, that Absolutely. would be great. And um, let's see, here we go. And I'm going to be, um, are, are you presenting, Stan? You're, you're muted, Stan. Let me unmute. There we go. Yeah, I put my slides up, John, just because it's in the interest of time. We're uh, past the top of the hour. But first, Adam, this was really excellent. I just want to just thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, being here today and suggesting even uh, I'm just looking, Josh, at you because you're the, you know, you're, you're the prime banker here among the three of us right now that kind of run this, uh, the financial services. It seems like this is something that every banks credit card customers should watch to to see i mean this we, and, and this will be on the financial service the, the secure the village website uh within the next few days as well so we'll make that available to banks uh to to show their their uh their their their, their customers who who take credit cards but this this was absolutely fabulous adam uh, i would only add to it as well if you are interested in the skimming part of the story the gas station stuff. Look up Brian Krebs. He's done a, a really nice job over the years of writing about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, documented one case uh, down in Mexico. Uh, I forget which one of the tourist districts where, uh, sure enough, somebody uh, offered the technical people $100, $1,000, whatever it was. And all the public ATM machines and all the hotels were basically uh, collecting information. Uh, credit card information and stuff was uh, going through them. So uh, what, what you're looking at is our programs. We've got uh, several, you're invited to all of them, all of you, as, as I've mentioned uh, uh, earlier, some of you are, are on, on a regular basis and, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, also sign up and, and Adam, please do this. Join our, we have a village square. Sign up as a cyber leader, sign your business and safe kids, both up as cyber partners. Uh, help us promote events, uh, follow us on LinkedIn, all of you, you know, you can be sponsors, lots of opportunities, but we, you know, to secure the village, we need to grow the village, <laughs> is uh, the, the basic bottom line of, of that slide. Uh, I, this is one of my favorite slides, uh, and I, I, I show this on almost all meetings, that, uh, you know, a, a cyber secure global village is not something that's going to just happen by itself. If we want the future to be a certain way, we've got to go work to make it happen. The, the future is not a gift, it's an achievement, as Bobby Kennedy said, and, and we're all about achieving that cyber secure global village. Thanks again to BTI Growth Advisors, to Ray and Melody. Uh, you'll see Ray, and Ray next month will be able to be joining us as well. Uh, I have a book, uh, it's on Amazon, uh, called The Agnostic Patriot. It's a series of essays that I started writing 
back in Thanksgiving of 2001 after 9-11. And after writing these things for about 16 years, 18 years, I decided to collect them and put them in a book. If you want a free PDF, just put your name in the chat box and say agnostic or patriot or whatever. It's not right or left or Republican or Democrat or pro this or anti that. It's up above the battle. It's things that, like, as I discovered over 18 years of writing, it's the Declaration of Independence. It's the preamble to the Constitution, things of that nature uh, is what I write about. Here's contact information for John and Josh and, and myself. Um, and uh, with that, if, if any final, final comments, final words uh, from anybody, um, if not, uh, we'll see everyone next month. Take care, all. Okay, super. We're about to end. Save the chat box if you want. Uh, just click those three dots in the bottom right and click save. And with that, Adam, again, thank you. Uh, BTI, thank you. And we are adjourned.